Summary of the Man that Corrupted Hadleyburg by Mark Twain Hadleyburg is known far and wide as a good and honest place to live. People in the town are so proud of their reputation for being honest that they teach their kids how to be honest and keep them away from any temptations that might make them lose their moral character. Unfortunately, the people are so focused on themselves and their reputations that they don't pay much attention to people from other places. So, they accidentally hurt the feelings of a passing stranger. This visitor says he will get his own back, and he decides that the best way to do this is to ruin the town and show that its 19 most respected people, called 19ers, are not honest or moral. One night, the visitor goes to the home of Edward Richards, who works at the bank as a teller. Edward isn't home yet, so the man talks to Edward's wife, Mary, and tells her he needs to leave something with Edward. Then, he gives her a bag and walks away. Mary finds out that the sack has $40,000 worth of gold in it. When Edward gets home, he is so happy that he tells his wife that they need to hide the sack before anyone else finds out. Soon after, though, the couple chooses to follow the directions on the sack, which say that Edward should find the person who deserves the gold. In his note, the stranger says he used to be a poor better until someone in Hadleyburg gave him $20 and told him something that changed his life. Since then, he has made a lot of money and stopped gaming. Now, he wants to thank the person who helped him, but he doesn't know who it was. So, his note tells Edward that the man who deserves it should send a note with the phrase he said to the stranger that fateful night. If this phrase is the same as the one in a sealed package inside the sack, the gold should be given to the person who claims it. Edward has two options, he can do the investigation in secret, or he can tell everyone about it. The note says that if he wants to do things in public, Reverend Burgess should gather the letters and read them out loud in the town hall a month later. This makes Edward and Mary confused because Reverend Burgess has been shamed because the town has turned against him because of something bad that no one can explain. People don't know that Edward could have proven Burgess's innocence, but he didn't because he didn't want to get caught up in the incident. Even though he didn't help Burgess, he felt bad about it, so he sneaked over to the Reverend's house to warn him right before the people of Hadleyburg showed up to run him out of town. Burgess has been very thankful ever since. After telling Mary this story, which she didn't know before, Edward thinks it would be best to do the investigation in public. He goes to the printing office and tells the editor, Mr. Cox, what happened. When he and Mary get home, they start to regret what they did and wish they had kept the money for themselves. Thinking this way, Edward goes back to the building where the papers were printed to stop them from sharing them. He runs into Mr. Cox again, who just had a similar talk with his own wife and also wants to keep the money. But when they get to the buildings, they find out that the papers have already been sent out to be delivered. Everyone in town thinks that Barclay Goodson must have helped the stranger because he is the only person in Hadleyburg who could have done that. Goodson has recently passed away, so he can't get the prize. Soon, each of the 19ers gets a letter from a man named Howard Stevenson who says that he thinks they deserve the sack of gold. Stevenson says in the letters that Barclay Goodson really did help the stranger. He says he knows because he was also there. Stevenson says that he was with Goodson when he made the comment that will win the gold for the claimant. He also tells each of the 19ers, in their own letters, that Goodson complimented them personally that same night. For example, Stevenson tells Edward that Goodson said nice things about him and that Goodson thought Edward did a lot for him. Stevenson says that Edward might not remember this service, but he should know that Goodson wanted to thank him for his kindness, no matter what it was. Stevenson's letter says, I remember, Goodson, saying he didn't like anyone in town, not one person, but that you, I think he said you, am almost sure, had done him a very great service once. And if he had a lot of money, he would leave it to you when he died. So, if you were the one who helped him, you are his rightful heir and deserve the sack of gold. He then tells Edward, and every other 19er, the line that will get him the sack of gold, you are far from being a bad man, go, and reform. Stevenson's letters make the 19ers very happy, but at first they are hesitant because they can't think of any reason why Goodson would want to pay them back. 
But as the days go by, they slowly start to believe that they did help Goodson in some important way. So, all 19 of them write letters to Reverend Burgess saying the same thing. The day has finally come to decide who gets the gold. Not only does everyone in Hadleyburg go to the town hall, but reporters and people from other places come to see the show. Burgess opens the first note, reads it out loud, and finds out that it was written by Deacon Bilson. As Bilson stands up to take the prize, lawyer Wilson does the same because he thinks Burgess said his name. The two men fight about who really wrote the note, and Wilson says that the priest took his answer. Then Burgess opens Wilson's note and reads it out loud. The crowd then realizes that both men gave the same answer. Wilson is a lawyer, so he manages to get everyone to agree that Bilson stole his original note and wrote his own. Before he can fully claim the prize, though, Burgess tells the crowd that he shouldn't open the sack to compare its comment until all of the entries have been read out loud. So starts a rowdy series of events in which the 19ers and their dishonest ways are revealed one by one, they all wrote the same comment, much to the wild joy of the crowd. At one point, Edward gets up to try to stop the process before his name is called, but Burgess cuts him off because he thinks he's trying to help the other shamed men. He tells Edward that everyone knows he's a good man, but he shouldn't feel sorry for the other 19ers who aren't honest. Edward sits down again and waits for his own public shame. Surprisingly, Burgess stops before he says Edward's name and says that he has read all of the entries. Now, he opens the letter in the sack. It says that there was never a gambler or a test remark. The visitor talks about how he wants to ruin Hadleyburg. He says that the town is weak because its virtues have never been tested in the fire. People in 19 are so proud of Edward because he didn't give in to the stranger's charms like the rest of them. Because of this, they start bidding on the sack of gold, which turns out to be a pile of lead discs. The money they raise will go to Edward. During this process, an unknown man drives up the bids, and in the end, he pays $1,282 for the sack. He then stands up and says that he buys and sells rare things. He says that because this event has been so widely reported, the lead coins might actually be worth a lot of money, especially if he stamped the names of the 18 men who had done something bad on them. Next, Dr. Harkness, who is running against Pinkerton, another 19er, in a political race, quietly offers to buy the sack. Harkness and Pinkerton are the two wealthiest people in town, and Harkness makes plans with the stranger to buy the lead for $40,000 without anyone knowing. The next day, he meets the stranger and gives him a bunch of checks that add up to the amount they decided on. The stranger then puts these checks in an envelope and gives it to Edward and Mary. When Mary gets the letter, she learns that the stranger is the same person who gave her the gold, so she and her husband figure out that he must also be Howard Stevenson. So, they know they can't cash these checks because they likely have Stevenson's name on them, which is too shocking for them to be linked to. Before Edward throws the checks into the fire, though, he notices that they are signed by Harkness. He doesn't cash them because he doesn't know what to do with them. Just then, Burgess sends a letter. In it, the minister says that he didn't say Edward's name because he felt he owed him since Edward told him that the people of Hadleyburg were going to attack him. This letter makes Edward and Mary more worried and makes them feel even worse about what they could have done to help Burgess. Edward could have done a lot more than just warn Burgess, he could have cleared the man's name completely. In the weeks before the town meeting, Edward and Mary worry that everyone will find out their dirty little secret. Edward even starts to think that Burgess wants to find out who he is. At some point, the stress gets too much and they both get sick. Edward then burns the checks. On his deathbed, Edward tells Burgess and a few other people who were there that Burgess lied to save him. Burgess tries to say this isn't true, but Edward won't let him. He doesn't know that he's hurting Burgess's image again. Then he dies, and Mary dies soon after. Hadleyburg changes its name after this scandal, and Harkness wins the election by putting Pinkerton's name on all of the lead coins. The town also changes its slogan from Lead US Not Into Temptation to Lead US Into Temptation. 
Twain writes, it is an honest town once more, and the man who catches it sleeping again will have to get up early. About the author. Mark Twain, whose real name was Samuel Clemens, grew up in a small port town on the Mississippi called Hannibal, Missouri. His father died when he was 11, and he started working at the Hannibal Journal as a typesetter when he was 12. Twain learned on his own while working as a printer in New York, Philadelphia, Cincinnati, and St. Louis. He then worked as a steamboat pilot on the Mississippi for 10 years. He spent several years traveling around the American West while building his name as a writer. When his short story, The Celebrated Jumping Frog of Calaveras County, came out in 1865, it made him famous all over the country. In 1870, Twain married Olivia Langdon. They had three children together and most of the time lived in Hartford, Connecticut. Twain was a globally renowned historian of American culture who exposed its flaws and hypocrisies in playful, satirical fiction and autobiography at the time of his death. Hope we summarized it fully and you liked it. Please hit the like button and subscribe to our channel so that we are motivated to create more videos.